The only way to achieve this is by smashing the price of physical gold by the production of paper gold with the help of futures markets and the connivance of the alchemists, the bullion traders. Yes, that includes me. I was deputy managing director of Makata and Goldsmith. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcadia Economics. Hope your week is off to a great start already. And in today's video, I'm going to catch you up to speed on some of the recent gold and silver news. Some interesting comments out of Peter Hambro, former gold insider, talking about some of the dynamics of the gold price suppression. We'll also be going through the latest COT bank positioning in the silver market as well as some of the other economic news that has come out recently and is worth keeping an eye on. So with that said, let's dig in. And here is the article from Peter Hambro titled, Don't Forget the Golden Rule, Whoever Has the Gold Makes the Rules. And he talks about disinformation for many years has kept the lid on this tinderbox. Since 2018, the financial stability desks at the World Central Banks have followed the Bank of International Settlements instructions to hide the perception of inflation by rigging the gold market. Of course, they cannot be seen to do this and they need cover. The only way to achieve this is by smashing the price of physical gold by the production of paper gold with the help of futures markets and the connivance of the alchemists, the bullion traders. Yes, that includes me. I was deputy managing director of Makata and Goldsmith, managed to create an unshakable perception that ounces of gold credit to an account or bullion dealer were the same as the real thing. Once investors swallowed this stupefying pill, was easy for them to see that gold simply didn't exist. Of course, there were wary investors who wanted to be assured that the gold would be there when it was called for. Easy, we said, don't bother to pay for it. Just give us an initial cash margin, agree to variation margin, and our paper promise is as good as gold. That was the simple derivative to make the bogus gold look even safer. The Bank of England was quietly willing to lend the London gold market members physical gold in the event that things got a bit tricky and our vaults were empty. When one of the members went bust, the others clubbed together and with the Bank of England holding the ropes, the customers were bailed out. He also mentions here, derivatives are unmargined and thus have no limit and may not even be on the balance sheet. Great banks of Wall Street will accept our fiat dollars as margin and manufacture gold to swamp the market. So certainly in line with a lot of the things that I talk about regularly on the show, as well as many of the guests that I have on here, but interesting to see someone from inside one of those shops even confirming as much. And interesting how he concludes here, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping are among those who know the golden rule. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. And that's something I actually talked about in a roundtable on Rob Keats's show back on Friday, where... In terms of what is the, the spark that might ever change this, well, when I got into gold and silver back in 2009, there wasn't a counterparty out there like we've seen Russia now, where A, doing military actions that seem in direct conflict of what the U.S. administration would approve of, but they did invade Ukraine, they got slapped with the sanctions, used a gold backing, of course, we've heard story after story, official numbers a little harder to come by, but of China taking a lot of gold over the past decade. Now they're talking about a currency basket backed by commodities. How that will play out, we'll only find out in time. Yet it's interesting to notice what Peter's saying here at the end of whoever has the gold makes the rules. The U.S. has a lot of paper. Russia and China and the BRICS nations have metal and commodities and something backing their currency. So one of the reasons why I do think there is a limited shelf life on the current environment, factor in some of the things going on with the Fed that are putting pressure on the US system, which we'll touch on later. So anyway, there's just another data point of what has been going on in the gold market, how paper is often used to push around the price. And speaking of which, we did have a new COT report last week, as always, which showed that on this price decline, banks continue to cover their short positions and increasingly go long. Here you see the commercials increasing their long contracts, reducing some of the shorts and the large speculators increasing shorts and reducing their long positions slightly, which is a trend we've seen over the last couple of weeks gotten to an extreme level 
In fact, uh, fortunately, Dave Kranzler even put some nice highlighted colors on the disaggregated commitment of traders report where you see the swap dealers, another metric of the banks. And here again, reducing their short positions, increasing their long positions and the exact opposite for the managed money funds, which at least traditionally we've seen when the banks get less short, flat or long. That's generally been when the price starts to go up. When the managed money funds are getting long, that's generally when the price is getting near to the point where it gets clobbered. And as Dave, myself and others have pointed out, often a lot more paper trading rather than physical gold moving hands. The reports that I hear from bullion dealers is that even on the lower prices, the majority of their orders are people buying and very few sell orders. Andy Schechtman, who's been on the show quite a bit, has talked about that. Also did check in with another dealer on Friday who mentioned that he's starting to get orders for a thousand ounce bars as well. So again, where is the break point? We shall see. But even while the price is getting clobbered, when you look at some of the things that are happening beneath the surface, does indicate a much different picture. I know it's not always easy if you are an owner of gold and silver bullion hearing that when the price is going down, but at least we can continue to report what's happening beneath the surface so you can have full information of that as you make your decisions. One note about those COT reports, this was from last month. I would meant to mention this. I may have talked about it briefly, but the CFTC finds JP Morgan for swap reporting failures. So JP Morgan having a lot of trouble with that CFTC lately. And here you can see for the company's failure to comply with the reporting obligations related to the swap dealing, that's something uh, Dave and I wouldn't say argued about, but a lot of the times when I would point to the COT report, he would say that if that data is being reported honestly by the banks, that, one of, that would be one of the few honest things they've done. And again, just some evidence to support that. So meanwhile, as that's happening, the JP Morgan RICO charges spoofing case is still going on. Looks like John Edmonds, who was one of the first to admit to spoofing the markets, has been testifying against his former boss, Michael Nowak. And he mentions, if we wanted to buy low, we could. If we wanted to sell high, we could. I saw people trading for 20 years doing this. How could I not? And in response, the lawyer for Michael Nowak, David Meister, told the jury that Edmonds was eager to please, but that his trading skills didn't cut it and his job was eliminated. So a difference of opinion on that one. but. Will be interesting to see what else comes out of that trial. Article also mentions jurors heard testimony from Christopher Jackman, who was hired by the DOJ to analyze CME data and document what the government claims are spoof trades, along with chats from members of JP Morgan Precious Metals desk. So hopefully we'll get access to those at some point. Would be interesting to see what was on that. I would love to see some of the chats around. April 30th into May 1st, when the silver price was up at $49. I've never quite seen any chart like that where it just opens on Sunday night, drops $7. I mean, I don't, I don't know if all the bids were pulled or if it was just the offer from God, but certainly some less than glamorous comments from Deutsche Bank and UBS that came out of their case. And one can only imagine what the JP Morgan traders were saying then. But hopefully by the time this trial is done, we'll get access to some of those things and find out a little bit more about that. So certainly an interesting trial, and we will keep you posted on that one going forward. Here is a note regarding the economic news. This was from Craig Hemke's Sprott Money column last week and mentioning how we've seen this transition a day after Powell's assurances about the economy, markets are worried that the Fed breaks something. Powell says recession a possibility, but not likely. Recession likely that is not elevated. Powell says Fed can invert recession, but task is getting tougher. Then you mix in some of the data, US economy officially contracted at a 1.6% rate in Q1 and the GDP now forecast, this is from the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, Latest estimate is negative 1.5% GDP now model estimates for real GDP growth in the second quarter of 2022 is negative 1.5% on July 15th. So if that does indeed come in anywhere near that number, I guess that would be the official definition of a recession, whether that definition of the recession of two quarters of negative growth is really the most accurate way of telling when things are slowing down. I'm not sure, but at least something that people often cite. Perhaps more significant 
here you see Google to slow hiring for the rest of the year. And it's not just Google, but Google joins other tech companies, big and small, that are scaling back expansion of their staff as rising inflation and other economic challenges contribute to a cool down in the tech sector. Now, I'll be the first to admit, perhaps I have a little bit of a biased perspective coming from the viewpoint that if you print money and flood the economy with easy credit, yeah, things are going to look great. But then if you take that easy money away, you're going to get pretty much the natural opposite of that. And I think we're seeing that play out. But even aside from that or the GDP numbers, with inflation still soaring, even after the first couple of rate hikes, and now the Fed debating between 75 and 100 basis points, and still planning some hikes for later this year, gee, I would think if you're a hiring manager, you'd have to pause and think about that one a little bit. And I imagine they are. It seems like some of them have been to some degree already. And I'm not inside the minds of these hiring managers. So I don't know if they have the same concerns about the continued interest rate hikes that I do, although I'll bet a lot of them do. Taking a look over at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet was interesting in that you finally actually do see a little bit of a reduction. We've been looking at this chart regularly. This is the three month finally coming down a little bit. If you back out to the one year chart, you can see not that much. Or if you go live even a little further out compared to where we were in 2020, we're not even close yet. One of the topics we discussed, we did a round table that if you didn't catch, uh, this was about two weeks ago with Rafi Parber, Dave Pranzler, and Rob Keens about the money supply going negative. And that's one of the tenets of Austrian economics where things are great when you keep printing money. But once you stop adding new money in, let alone when you're withdrawing money, that's when things usually run into trouble, which is why it's not surprising to see slowing GDP or slowing mm -hmm. hiring rates which should this continue, which the Fed seems on pace now to do. Uh, we'll see for how long, but should that continue, I think you're going to continue to see more pressure on the system. Here is an article from CNBC, prepare for US dollar hit on S&P 500. Early warnings from Nike and Microsoft showed that the dollar gain this year will make second quarter sales and profits look weaker than they are for many companies. Obviously for companies that are exporting, that's going to put a crimp on their sales. One of the reasons why the central banks often love having devalued currencies because it at least allows their exporters to earn more revenue. Yet another one of the impacts that the rise in the dollar is having. Again, keep in mind that rises against the euro, the yen, and the British pound, and a few other currencies that aren't doing so well. Whereas the dollar is still struggling against the ruble as Russia and its partners continue to study backings to their currency. And perhaps further exacerbating the situation is that even after these rate hikes, we saw the CPI number last week. I'm sure many of you saw this wholesale price number as well, where it was up 11.3% in June, which I think of as somewhat of a leading indicator before things flow into the consumer prices. But it's interesting in that even with the big 75 basis point hike last month, we're still not seeing any impact. And keep in mind, they're talking about taking rates to three, three and a half percent, while inflation is at nine to 11 percent, depending on which metric you look at. That doesn't really seem like a solid formula, plus the other issues that are going on with sanctions, concerns about the food supply. I'm not sure that getting interest rates up to 3% is really going to stop that. And if you take a look at the CME FedWatch tool, which puts some probabilities backed out from the Fed funds futures, it's interesting to see how these are changing. Here you see in June and July of next year, already pricing in a rate cut. My guess is that we'll see a rate cut much sooner than that, because as the rates continue to rise, that's going to put more pressure on all these other factors that we've been talking about, which is what me and many others think is going to force the Fed to act sooner. Anytime the Fed says they're hiking rates, although they're going to be accommodative to the data and, you know, a couple of years ago, things were great until COVID came. Well, things are great now, but if there's food shortages or if there's escalations 
in tensions with Russia or elsewhere or any of the other things that can happen, especially when you're raising rates, which makes it more likely that there's going to be something that comes up. I personally think that we will see a pause or a rate cut much sooner than next June, but that's one of the things we will keep an eye on here. And you can hit the subscribe button and notification bell to stay posted on things like that. Also, home buyers canceling deals at the highest rate since the start of the pandemic. Home builders also seeing higher cancellation rates. Sheriff sale agreements on existing homes canceled in June was just under 15% of all homes that went under contract. This was the highest since early 2020 when home buying was paused for a while. Average rate on the 30-year fixed mortgage started this year around 3%, briefly shot up to 6% mid-June before settling around the 575 range now. And we take a look over at our mortgage chart. You can see right here, that's the spike up. Would think with further rate hikes on the way, we'll see a rise there. Also, higher mortgage rates have also caused some borrowers to no longer qualify for the loans they want. So a variety of factors cascading here that is not going to make things easier in the mortgage market, which is quite a large percentage of the U.S. economy. Although, at least on one hand, you could say it's going better than in Europe, where now they're on high alert as Russia temporarily halts gas flows via major pipelines. Interesting that as this is happening, how is you, the EU responding? By readying a seventh round of sanctions on Russia, even contemplating placing an oil price cap. I'm not sure exactly how that would work when they're the ones who need the oil. They've already sanctioned the country that's providing it. And just not a good situation. Meanwhile, in the same way that these sanctions often go in terms of the unintended consequences, you see India has rejected the U.S. and EU calls to boycott Russian oil, and they're buying the oil. The Reuters report further underscored that as the West moves to ban and sanction Russia oil altogether, it's China and India that now account for 50% of Russian seaborne exports, lured by hugely discounted prices compared to Brent. As we've been detailing, Russia's energy earnings are already back to pre-war levels after five months of round after round of U.S. and EU sanctions intended to punish Moscow and Putin, with analysts widely estimating Russia's energy sales are now back on track to reach $285 billion this year. Meanwhile, what has this done, the, the totality of all these things between the Fed rate hikes and the trouble in Europe? We've seen the euro drop to one-to-one -one with the dollar. Quite a stunning move, even just in 2022 alone, let alone going back to 2021, where it was up at a buck 20. And at least in my lifetime, I've been used to seeing that euro trade well over the dollar. And we're really seeing the impacts of that for the European market, certainly struggling right now. And again, an unfortunate situation, yet we'll just continue to report the news and any insight as it comes along. And a final note before we wrap up, I wanted to thank First Majestic Silver for bringing us today's video. As many of you know, they had their Jarrett Canyon deal last year, which has given them more gold exposure. Certainly a lot to do there, although checked in with First Majestic on Friday, and they feel that things are going well, ramping up production and expecting a profit in the fourth quarter on the Jarrett Canyon project. So we'll keep you posted on how things are looking there, but did want to thank First Majestic for supporting the show and bringing you today's episode. And with that said, we'll wrap up for now. But in terms of some more insight into the gold and silver markets, well, if you didn't catch Rafi's weekly silver report last Friday, well, you're going to want to see that and just click on the video that's coming your way now.